Welcome, everybody, to another episode of From Adversity to Abundance podcast. I am your host, Jamie Bateman, and I'm excited today to be joined by a special guest, Clint Fiore. Clint, how are you doing today? Doing great. How are you, Jamie? Doing well. Um, yeah, Clint, you uh, I know you're going through a, a business rebranding, and your new business is called Bison Business. Um and I'm really, like we were chatting briefly before we hit record. I'm, I'm really excited personally to, to dive into this because um, it's not a, the, the world that you run in is a little bit, it's, I'm familiar with it, but it's not, it's definitely not something I'm an expert in. So I'm very excited to uh, pick your brain and for you to add value to our audience. And, and hopefully uh, we can do the same for you. Um, speaking of our audience, for those who are unfamiliar with you, can you give us kind of a snapshot of who you are today and, and what you're up to? Sure. So I, yeah, I lead a company called Bison Business. We used to be called Texas Business Buyers, but we, like I said, we recently rebranded to go national and, and move outside of the nation of Texas. And uh, so we are excited about that. Um, we help people buy and sell companies. So we do mergers and acquisitions and business brokerage, buy side and sell side advisory. And uh, I've been doing that full time for about eight years and have a team that we work together on every deal. Uh, and we just help people, help good people do great business deals is kind of what we do and what we're known for. Um, I think we met because I, I came onto Twitter at the beginning of this year and just started storytelling and, and kind of explaining how the great game of small business acquisitions works. And those, some of those threads just kind of went viral and went super popular. And, and yep. all of a sudden I'm, I'm appearing on podcasts and things, <laughs> kind of telling the story of, yeah. of people doing small business deals. And there's a, there's kind of a big trend going on in, um, in that space. And I'm excited to be kind of riding that wave and to be a part of it. But yeah, that's, yeah I live I... in central Texas, married, have four beautiful kids and uh, I'm a pilot as my fun and business hobby. And uh, and yeah, so I'm just a family guy, business guy, but I've also, before business brokerage, I've started and sold a couple companies. Um, I've raised angel investment. So I've, I've kind of done startups and serial entrepreneurship. And then I became a, uh, a business evaluator, business broker, mergers and acquisition specialist. And, mm. and I've been doing that. Um, for eight years, but kind of serial entrepreneur turned broker is mm -hmm. how I would describe myself right now. Gotcha. Yeah. That's, there's so many uh, avenues I, I could go. Uh, there's so many kind of things you said there that I'd love to dive into, but obviously short on time, but um, yeah, I need to, first of all, I need to figure out the, uh, <laughs> I need to put more effort into my, my Twitter game, to be honest with you, because it is, it's a different platform um, and, and threads and stories is really are what, what do well on there. But, um, I'm curious if you could, before we jump into your backstory and, and some of the adversity that you've, you've gone through, um, curious. So what does, if there is a typical deal in your world and when you're brokering a, a business deal, what does that look like? Yeah, we work with profitable turnkey kind of businesses where I'd say the stereotypical deal, and they're not all like this, every deal is different, but the stereotypical would be someone that wants to retire. They've built up a really nice business. They thought their kids might come and take it over, but they all took their parents' advice and went to school and learned how to do something <laughs> else and went off and did something else. And and they just don't have a plan of how, to, how do I um, transition. And so we come mm -hmm. alongside those owners uh, and help them figure out what the company's worth. Is it ready to go to market? What does it need to kind of be ready to go to market and, and kind of put a plan together there. And then when it's ready, we put a bow on it, take it out to the, to buyers. And, and we're kind of like, almost like a dating service. I would say, you know, where we're matching the right, the buyers that have the right, um, finances, but also the right heart and are good culture fits and can kind of come in and and fill the role of the outgoing seller. Mm. And so, you know, any given moment we'll be working, you know, 10 to 15 transactions at a time. They're mostly one to 10 million in deal size, like the five to 50 employee range is where we like to play, um, which is 
I would call it premium main street to lower middle market is kind of my playground okay. at Bison business. And then we have several thousand qualified kind of pre-screened buyer relationships that have inquired in the past about other deals. And we maintain relationships with lots of buyers. Hmm. And then sometimes buyers bring us in on projects to help them on their side hmm. um, as buy side consultants. So we can work for, for either side. We're comfortable helping buyers out or sellers out and helping people execute a good strategy. But, um, you know, that's our typical deal. A lot of them are SBA financed. Some of them are, are traditional lending or, or cash deals. Um, but we know how to work, you know, all the different financial angles on these mm -hmm. and just be collaborative, educational and help people, uh, navigate that, that pretty complicated process. That's really interesting. I, we can't spend too much time on that, but I would, I would love to personally. <laughs> uh, but so just your typical buyer, are they, is it more of a passive role they're trying to play or are they trying to step in and, and run an active business? It, it is more active. So I just, from what I learned about your background, mm -hmm. I think you and a lot of your, your friends might be more into the passive income <laughs> stuff. And are you saying I'm lazy? <laughs> <laughs> I'm joking. <laughs> it's, it's business deals are attractive because the ROI is off the charts mm -hmm. uh, compared to almost anything else out there. But when people come in expecting it to be mailbox money, I kind of, yeah pop that bubble off sure. because there's yeah. no such thing in small business. Like you have to, I mean, you don't always have to go man the cash register and, and be in there, but you do have to watch it and you do have to oversee it. Right. And even if you have a manager, you still have to manage a manager and, yeah. and kind of keep your eyes on things. And so it's, it is great returns, but it is a little riskier and it is a little more hands-on Sure. And, uh, you know, note investing or real estate investing. Yeah. I mean, yeah, that's, that's, no, that's a really good point. And we'll, we'll jump off this, but I, uh, I actually do approach note investing in a similar with, from a similar mindset or, you know, um, perspective, because a lot of people do want that mailbox money. And once you get into, you know, running an NPL, like a non-performing note fund, or, you know, if you're, if you're running it as a business, like we do, it's not passive anymore, <laughs> yeah. you know? So I'm not out there swinging a hammer and doing physical labor, but, I, but it's, there's a lot to keep track of, you know? So my point is just like you, I end up bursting the bubble for people who, you know, Oh, I want that mailbox money as a note investor. Well, you can do that with a couple of performing notes. That's fine, but that's also not going to change your world overnight. Um, you know, like you want it to. Um, so I, yeah, the whole passive income, uh, thing is, a, a you know, we could, uh, we could, we'll save that for another, another episode, but, um, so let's dive into your backstory. I know you mentioned before we hit record, you mentioned a few, um, a few kind of types of adversity that you've, you've been through, um, and I'll let you start where you'd like to, um, you know, and we'll hit on the, uh, the thread that I think really uh, where I found you for, for the most part uh, about uh, I'll, I'll let you uh, let you run with it. I don't want to spoil anything. So where would you like to start? Sure. I mean, we can, we can go straight to the, to the fun story that everybody sure. likes to hear about which is <laughs> the, uh, the plane crash story. Yeah. Sounds, sounds good. Well, that doesn't sound good, but <laughs> I, I'm glad you're here to, to talk about it and I'm, I'm excited to, 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 uh, I guess, dive in, no pun intended, but, but yeah, um, let's talk about that. What, what happened on that, on that day? Sure. So I, um, I originally wanted to be a professional pilot. I looked up in the sky. I, I remember I was probably 12 years old and was in the back of my mom's minivan going somewhere on a road trip and just saw an airplane flying over and just thought, man, I'd rather be up there than down here. <laughs> Right. And it just kind of sparked my imagination. Nobody in my family flew. Um, I was being raised by a single mom. We didn't really have much money to dream about flight lessons or anything like that. But mm -hmm. I, I decided I set my part in my heart that I wanted to be a pilot. And by the time I was 13, 14, I, or probably 13, I had already picked out the school I wanted to go to. 
Uh, I figured out there's the number one aviation school in the world. It's called Embry Riddle. And I, um, you know, as a middle schooler, decided that's what I wanted to do. My mom was very supportive, but she kind of let me know, hey, that's a private school. It's very expensive. I don't right. know if we'll be able to pay to go there. So you need to make sure you get scholarships and stuff. And and so right. I went to a, um, actually went across town to a magnet high school that was mostly minority students that had special government funding for an aviation program. And I hmm. stuck with in high school for four years with this aviation program at this inner city magnet school and ended up um, getting my pilot's license at 17. So I soloed at 16, which is the youngest you're allowed to solo. Hmm. I got my license at 17. I never paid a penny for my pilot's license for my private license. Um, and then I, I ended up going to NASA my senior year of high school, um, selected with a group from the state of Texas um, to, to do some cool projects there. So I got to like go in the altitude chamber where they train astronauts. And then I got to ride on the NASA's KC-135 called the Vomit Comet, which is the one that does zero gravity uh, flights over the Gulf of Mexico. And I've got wow. over 20 minutes of zero gravity time. You do it 30 wow. seconds at a time um, wow. as you fly these parabolas. Um, it's just extreme pitch up, about 50 degrees nose high, and then pitch down about 50 degrees nose low. And over the top, you're floating. They're holding perfect zero gravity inside, and it's a huge jet liner. It's a four-engine uh, military jet that's padded floor to ceiling, and um, you're flying around, floating around in there. And so that is wild. <laughs> yeah, because of my um, my experience at Hershey High School in Wichita Falls, Texas, and getting to go to NASA and and all the things I did there, um, and then just doing good in school and on test scores and stuff. I ended up getting pretty much a full ride um, to my dream university nice. and <clears throat> was able to kind of live the dream that I that I had picked as a young boy uh, mm -hmm. to, to become a pro pilot. And so here I am in school, in my dream university, getting my flight training. Um, I, I came in already a private pilot. And I'm going through my um, my next rating. So I've got my multi-engine rating and I'm working on my commercial rating. And at this point, I'm like 19 years old. I'm a sophomore in uh, I'm a sophomore at the school. It's November 29th. I'm flying myself in a uh, Cessna 172, which is the most common trainer, four seat high wing uh, training aircraft. I went to the Prescott, Arizona campus, which is a beautiful Northern Arizona location. And on this particular day, I had kind of a triangular cross country flight where I was going from uh, Laughlin, Nevada uh, to, I believe it was Laughlin to Vegas and back or okay. something like that. Mm -hmm. And um, on one of the legs of the flight, I'm kind of between Nevada and Northern Arizona, which is pretty much resembles Mars. I mean, it's <laughs> high <laughs> desert, rocky, jagged, yeah. uh, you know, just bad lands types of mountains. I and, just did some, uh, some, we did a, in this mastermind group, we, we, one little excursion we did in, uh, outside of Scottsdale and Phoenix, which is, uh, not exactly where you're talking about, but we did some, uh, UTV riding, uh, and it's, I spent a year in Iraq and it's not that much different <laughs> yeah, <laughs> than the very desert, rugged, very rugged. <laughs> but, uh, anyway, yep. So it's, it's rugged and, and, uh, desert, right? Yeah. Yeah. And so I am, you know, I, I trained to fly in North Texas. I was kind of a flatland pilot and I didn't know much about mountain flying, but you know, I'm young. I was good at, I was good at flying and I am, uh, ahead of schedule on this flight and I needed to burn a little bit more time in the air just to hit the requirement I was trying to get for hours on this cross country. And so I just was out in the middle of nowhere. I started doing some sightseeing. I, I deviated from my planned altitude and flew down to the desert uh, floor, just like looking at stuff. And um, I found like an old abandoned World War II looking 
airstrip out in the middle of the desert, which was cool. Hmm. And, you know, I'm just sightseeing. And after I burned off about 30 minutes, I, I went GPS direct straight from where I was to Prescott, where I was headed. In between me and there is a mountain range. And um, I just initiated a climb back up to my cruise altitude and, and was trucking along. And, and before long, you know, I'm still in this climb and the, the Cessna doesn't climb very fast at high altitude. It's, mm -hmm. it's 180 horsepower and it's, you have to plan your climbs, uh, mm -hmm. they take a while. And I just kind of noticed I wasn't climbing very well. Mm -hmm. And eventually I noticed I wasn't climbing at all. And mm -hmm. then I noticed I was not even, I was descending, you know, and, mm -hmm. and I was confused by this because I was holding the right airspeed, holding the right power settings. And I knew what my plane should be doing. It should be doing, you know, 500 feet per minute climb or something like that. But my vertical speed was stopped hmm. and then starting to decrease. So and you, you deviated from the, the set, um, path or, or, um, uh... Now, mm -hmm. You deviated some previously, but not in an unsafe way. And now at this point, you were just doing everything you were supposed to do. Is that right? So, you see, yeah, I'm running through just kind of troubleshooting, trying to figure out why is my plane not mm -hmm. performing. Right. And in aviation, things can go sideways pretty quickly. And, mm -hmm. and it went from kind of like a curiosity to a... <laughs> this is might be dangerous <laughs> to I'm about to die, like, like really wow. fast. And, um, and basically I, once I realized I couldn't, I couldn't get my climb fixed, even though my engine looked good and, uh, you know, I couldn't figure out what was wrong. I was like, man, I may need to turn around and get out of this mountain range to hmm. get back towards that Valley where I came from in case I need to put it down in the desert and just figure out what's up. And I made a turn that I thought was going to be leading me around a hill, like a uh, escape path, but I, mm -hmm. it was the wrong turn. I made a dead end turn basically into what's called a box Canyon. It, okay. it essentially funnels you up a Canyon that you can't get out of. And I, um, it was too narrow for me to turn around. I was right at the top of the ridges. So it, for a minute, I was still thinking I could out climb this mountain. I could get out. And mm -hmm. I pointed at the lowest point of the ridge line and I kept full power and I was holding VX, which is your best angle of climb speed. Uh, okay. That's a pilot term for the okay. best, the best airspeed to hold to get you out of that situation. But the plane just kept going down. It just kept descending and it wouldn't, I just couldn't get altitude. And so I just realized, holy crap, I'm, I'm about to crash. And, um, you're just making it up on the fly. I'm, I'm, <laughs> you know, I'm a Christian guy. Um, I'm kind <laughs> of like focusing on, uh, I, I tried to do a mayday call. I was out in the middle of nowhere. I don't think anybody could hear me. Um, I'm just thinking, how can I crash this thing and survive? I'm focusing on flying, but I'm also kind of talking to God. I'm like, well, I didn't see that coming. You know, like, right. I didn't know yeah. today was my last day. Um, yeah. It's like, when does this, the technical part of flying transition to less important, you know? Yeah. And now it's like, no, my life is almost over. I mean, that, that's, yeah. I, so, I, so I definitely have imagine. the whole like, time slowing down life flash before your eyes experience but i kept kind of hands on the controls and flew as far as i could down the canyon and at the last possible moment before it dead ended i made a left hand 90 degree turn which is about all i could get out of the turn and then rolled the wings level just went straight out the wall which was about a 50 degree slope and covered in rocks and boulders just jagged rock wall pointed right at it, brought my nose up. So I, I pulled the yoke all the way back into my lap to bring the nose as high as I could and basically tried to time it to where I could almost stall it into the into the mountain at the last second because I didn't want the nose to hit low. Mm -hmm. And I also didn't want to cartwheel down the mountain, flip a wing or, or anything like that. And so I just took it straight on. That's the, that's the best logic I could come up with was just try to kind of belly flop it into the 
right side I of mean, the mountain they, and that's they, they, yeah essentially what i did is i i came in i was i was driving straight at it keeping the airspeed as slow as i could but without stalling and losing control and the last minute i just yanked the nose up and i'd say belly flopped into the side <laughs> of, the, of the canyon um it's crazy. I mean, they're all bad options, obviously, at this point. But yeah, I, I can picture what you're saying. I mean, it it's, seems like you know the the least bad option. So, I mean, so then, so then, what happened? Yeah. So then, literally the next moment. So I remember seeing the rocks coming at me. I remember hearing a loud noise of the impact, and I was, I'm short. I'm scooted up in my seat seatbelt buckled hands on the controls flying it all the way in and i literally hit the wall and the next instant that i can remember i'm outside the plane hmm. and i have no clue how i got from inside the plane to outside the plane it's it's a memory hole it's just a, a blank even even to this day right yeah to this day yep. um so i i find myself on the side of a mountain pretty much under the wing of the plane, about 10 feet from where I was sitting, laying on the ground. And I look up and I'm, I'm right next to the wing and the wings hanging off and there's a waterfall of fuel coming out and I can still hear, I mean, I had, I was full power going in and I can still hear the, the gyros and the instrument panel spooling down, you know, like hmm. going, going down and so i know like no time had passed because the gyros mm -hmm. are still spinning down mm -hmm. fuel still spew spewing mm -hmm. out of the plane and i'm thinking oh no the this thing's about to blow up because i thought it would catch on fire or explode mm -hmm. and i'm right by i'm right beside it and so i quickly kind of got up and scrambled away from the wreckage and the plane didn't blow up it didn't fall down the mountain it just hit and stuck and kind of dis disintegrated <laughs> into the side of the mountain and i'm patting myself down trying to figure out because i thought i was in shock you know you know the stories of people that if mm -hmm. you're in military and stuff it's yeah. like people don't know they're hurt until sure yeah absolutely oh, you know I, I got shot and i didn't even know it you know yeah um and so i'm i'm checking myself out for injuries and yeah. i had no injuries i was I didn't have a scratch on my body. I wasn't even hurt. I, I didn't even feel any pain. And yeah, we we I'll just we had an episode uh, previous uh, to this one. Uh, John Creasel he lost both of his legs in an IED accident, and um, I guess that was in Afghanistan. But um, it might have been actually that was Iraq. But yeah, what you're saying, he didn't know it at first. You know, he. Mm -hmm. uh, he you don't just know right away that you've lost, that you've been injured so badly. So, yeah. So in your case, you're, you're not sure yet. Yeah. Um, so then you, you sounds like you found out that you were fine, right? Is, is yeah. that? Yeah. Okay. So I, I actually wasn't hurt um, yeah. and I was worried I was and just didn't know it. And yeah, sure. you're right. That's absolutely a thing that people yeah. experience. Um, and so I, I then, you know, just quickly, my brain switched to how do I survive this scenario? And I'm, right. I'm thinking the plane still might catch on fire. And I'm mm -hmm. at, I'm at the high desert on a mountain, I'm down in a canyon. And I've got like nothing. Uh, and it's the afternoon. And it's November 29th. It's going to be a cold high desert night. And mm -hmm. I didn't, I wanted to get, there's a little survival kit in the back of all the planes. And I wanted to grab that before the plane caught on fire or mm -hmm. something. So I kind of made a break for it, went back to the plane, broke open the tail and grabbed this little survival kit, which turns out to be pretty chintzy little <laughs> survival <laughs> kit. I, I wish <laughs> we had better ones, but uh, it was what it was, but it was something. And then I got it and got away from the plane and it mm -hmm. just sat there, drained the fuel drained out and it got deadly quiet. And it was just surreal. All of a sudden I just find myself by yourself. I mean, yeah, all alone. Right. In a Canyon middle of nowhere. Right. And um, you're obviously happy to be alive, happy to be not injured. Yeah. Uh, 
but <laughs> still facing some serious, you know, doubts of your future, I would guess. Is that, is that fair? Yeah. I mean, I, I still thought I was going to die and I, I guess it was just kind of this feeling like no one's going to find me. Um, I wasn't on my exact flight path because I had mm -hmm. deviated and, and done. So I, I was like, I didn't know anyone would be able to find me. Mm -hmm. I knew I had to get found to survive. And so I just then proceeded to kind of climb up out of this canyon. And the plane was was down under this ridge line in a canyon in a world of canyons. There's, I mean, it's mm -hmm. a whole landscape covered in crevices and canyons and things. Mm -hmm. And so it's not obvious where the plane is. Mm -hmm. And so I started hiking uphill and just made it, then it was very tough going, very steep, loose rocks and things. And I, I got to the top of this ridge and then I hiked along this ridge to the highest point nearby. And I mm -hmm. grabbed, I had a sectional map with me from my flight bag and I had my survival kit and I figured out where I was on the map and I surveyed 360 degrees around me and there's not a drop of water. There's not, so there's no water source. There's no road. There's no sign of human life. It's, it's literally like I'm on another planet. And people don't realize how big this planet is, but there's <laughs> vast mm -hmm. sections of unpopulated <laughs> area where there's just no evidence that humans even exist. And that's where I mm. happened to crash this airplane. Wow. And, and so here I am, you know, like in the middle of Mars, <laughs> like on this mountaintop, uh, it's about 9,000 feet elevation. Um, I, I took a silver solar blanket out of the, survival kit mm -hmm. and got a stick and some rope and built that into like a flag on top of one of the peaks uh that would be reflective and i'm trying to get i'm trying to get found mm -hmm. and, and this I is the another, afternoon late afternoon kind of thing yeah yeah and then i hiked another ridge line to another peak that was a little taller and then i made another signal out of the tent there was like one of those really cheap uh, uh orange tube tent things Okay. And I turned that into basically a windsock on the top of another ridge. And so now I had an orange windsock and I had a silver flag on two different peaks. And once I did that, I mean, I'm just still scanning around for an airplane or anything. There's nothing. There's nothing in the sky. There's nothing on the ground. And I just feel right. all alone out here. Right. There's no sign of life at all. Yeah, nothing. Yeah. And so I just sat out there and... Um, I was really grateful that I had survived the crash. Um, I still thought I was going to die, but I wrote letters. I wrote goodbye letters to like all my family. Oh, and wow. Friends. And I get a little emotional talking about it because it's mm -hmm. like, I can imagine. I mean, it's the, yeah. the gratitude of just surviving the impact and getting that chance because as a, young dude mm -hmm. middle of three boys not knowing how to handle his emotions and stuff like and and he went through a lot as a kid i just like i realized i never told anyone i cared about like how mm -hmm. i felt mm -hmm. right yeah and, that's, that's... and it just kind of hit me like a ton of bricks and so i was so grateful that i just kind of got to sit there and write letters mm -hmm. and share my heart with with the people closest to me and and was I just remember thinking, even if I die, I'm just so grateful I got to write hmm. write my thoughts. But it's wild. Um, so as yeah, as you probably uh, ascertained, I didn't die. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, we, we've got some some uh, smart listeners. So um, <laughs> we did, I think, figure that one out. So yeah, so so unfortunately, we got to somewhat gloss over the the ending it, mm -hmm. so um how how did you survive i mean what what happened yeah so after a few hours i finally did a, see a plane in the in the distance and it had been out searching for me after i didn't come back on my flight plan okay um, i had a little signal mirror and so i'm like signaling 
with the setting sun to try to like catch a glint off of that and get them out there. And, and then they, wow. thank, good, thank goodness, they did finally see me. They saw the flags and stuff and they rocked their wings and I knew they had seen me. They circled okay. for a bit and could see that I was walking around and waving at them. And then they flew off and then got quiet again. And then I hear a helicopter. And okay. so, they they called me in you know and then a dps helicopter came out of came out of kingman arizona which was the nearest city okay and the dps folks at kingman were the ones that picked me up right at dark i mean i was right right at dark um i had to walk about a quarter mile just to where they could put one skid down on that mountain because it was extremely so when that and, when that plane left did you know they someone was coming back or what was going through I, your mind at yeah that point? i mean because i knew they had seen me Mm -hmm. and that's all i needed i just needed right. someone to know i was alive and where i was sure. so I, gotcha. I i had a pretty good idea <laughs> there would be a rescue effort at that point and that, that really lifted my spirits that thinking that i was going to make it out now D gps is what uh is like the department of public safety or whatever. okay gotcha got it so that's where the plane and the helicopter were from or no the plane um, was from embry riddle it was a okay. twin engine trainer and they had diverted some of the training air, airplanes that were out flying in the area because it's a big flight school. Sure. And so it actually organized some of the flight students that were out practicing okay. in the region saying, hey, we lost somebody. Look around and try to find them. And, and so one of the kids that was out there with their instructor ended up spotting hmm. me. Wow. Wow. That's that that is wild. So you know, there's, <laughs> there's so much we could talk about. Um, I guess, you know, what, what are one or two things you've taken from this, um, from this incident? And I know there's a lot more, you know, you're not even fully saved yet, but it sounds like once you got on, I guess you got on the helicopter and then. Yeah. I mean, it was a whole ordeal. Um, getting, once I got picked up, I was physically safe, but I still had mm -hmm. a lot to go through with, mm -hmm the crash investigation and mm. dealing with the fallout with the FAA and the NTSB in my school. And I ended mm. up kind of kicked out of my flight training program, which was like my big dream. And, um, and the school kind of wanted to place all the blame on me, which it was my fault. Like I, it was an accident that I, I got myself into, but I didn't, I didn't know what had happened for a long mm -hmm. time. And then I, as I learned about mountain flying, I learned I had kind of been caught up in what's called a mountain wave where hmm. the air is coming over the uh, ridge line and just coming down on the other side faster than your plane can climb. Hmm. And Interesting. because I had started at kind of a lower altitude, kind of behind the power curve, I didn't mm -hmm. recognize it soon enough. And then I made a wrong turn. And so it was my own like aeronautical decision making that got me into that situation, mm. but it was, it was truly an accident and it was a lack sure. of experience of mountain flying. And I encourage all pilots to really learn mountain flying and the hazards of it. If you're going to fly anywhere near mountains, because it can, one mistake can be your last in the, when you're flying around mountains. Well, and, it, and, and again, how old were you at this point? 19. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> you know, I, I don't know what I was, you know, my friends and I were doing in cars at 19, you know, it's, um, I, I, I can't blame you <laughs> for deviating yeah. or, um, so I think it probably would be easy for someone to look back and say, well, it was his fault for doing that. But, you know, 19 year old guy wanting to, it just, I can see why, why you got into that situation, but, um, okay. So just looking back, you know, obviously you've had decades since then yeah. um can you pull out one or two kind of lessons uh that you've been able to apply or just anything uh from that particular situation that's uh, a, a takeaway that you've been able to apply to your personal life or or even your business yeah i i think that uh and i've met over the years many people that have had near death experiences like that and it is it is kind of a superpower i think once hmm. you once you've kind of faced death in a way where you pretty mm -hmm. much knew, I knew what I was looking at and thought, I'm, this is I'm it. dead. You know, this is it. Mm -hmm. And um, just very grateful to God. I give him the credit. I My heart says an angel pulled me out of that plane um, mm -hmm. and I can't prove it and I didn't <laughs> see it. And I, I, but I just, I don't have a good explanation physically for it. 
Mm -hmm. um, a boulder came through the floor where my feet should have been and displaced the rudder pedals that my feet were touching and wow the windshield's gone every bit of instrumentation shattered right in front of where my face would have been um the tails hanging off the wings hanging off the engine cowling went up the mountain and was off of the front of the plane and for me to come out without a scratch was just there's no Hmm. Natural logical explanation. explanation. So I right. give a supernatural explanation for it and give God the credit. Um, but the, I'd say what I really took away <laughs> is that um, this this kind of perspective, and I'm, and I'm almost double the age. I think I might have been 20. I was 19 or 20 when the crash happened, but mm -hmm. I'm almost to double the mm -hmm. age of when I crashed. Mm -hmm. I'm 39 right now, and just feeling like my whole life has been like extra innings or like bonus time. Mm -hmm. it, it's this great perspective to just know that no matter what struggle I'm going through or what I'm, it's like, well, I should already be dead. So just <laughs> yeah. being alive yeah. and facing this thing is better than me dying before. Uh, and, and like everything I now hold dear as like the most, valuable things in my life my wife my four kids mm -hmm. um you know like all of that happened post crash right and so it's almost like i was given this whole new other life hmm. that i was able to experience mm -hmm. and and then um and so it's just like a, an evergreen ability to zoom out yeah and figure out what really matters and what really doesn't matter sure and, and when you're on the other side of that, I remember like the next few days right after it happened, almost feeling like a disembodied spirit is, mm -hmm. is how I would describe it of I'm here on earth at my school, talking to people, going mm -hmm. around and doing things, but mm -hmm. I'm floating above it. Mm -hmm. And, and it was just funny because it's like all these things that everyone cares about, you're just laughing at because you're like, <laughs> because well, yeah the experience was so intense right um, death has this way of just cutting through all the bs and yeah. you know everything that doesn't matter truly doesn't matter and everything that does matter does matter and it's mm. like it's like the veil is removed from your existence all of a sudden you see everything so clearly mm. and to me it was like god and people were kind of what mattered and like sure. all the other little minutia and drama and bs we we're all caught up in all day long yeah was laughable and that's why i felt like this this embodied spirit i guess walking around because i just saw yeah. all these people stuck in their little their little world of yeah and, and the, it was it, all just silly stuff that didn't matter I can, I can only imagine more recently what you've how your view of uh social media and yeah the, the thing the things everyone gets offended about you know now <laughs> everyone's so easily offended I, I can only imagine what you're what's going through your mind but um so now you, you said, you mentioned you previously, you told me that you've had some, some business struggles, um, or at least some adversity you faced from a business standpoint. I'm just curious how the, you know, the, the near death experience impacted your perspective, um, as you navigated business challenges. Yeah. I mean, I guess my two big, uh, takeaways were, you know, always tell the people around you how you feel and and make sure that you make that a regular rhythm in your life because you never know what day will be your last. Sure. And the it's other really, thing is that, really good. that what matters matters and what doesn't matter doesn't matter. And, and it's allowed me to, um, I think, take more risk in business. And and it feels like I have a, a higher risk tolerance, which I think is a big key to success in entrepreneurship mm -hmm. because no success as an entrepreneur comes without taking substantial sure. personal, financial, and even reputational risk in, yeah. in these ventures. And so um, just being able to zoom out and be like, well, no matter what happens, I'm living on bonus time, <laughs> you know, but yeah. I still, I'm not perfect. Like I get caught up in bull crap mm -hmm. all the time you know right but, but i can just pull myself out of it when i need to 
even though I'm prone to, to get sucked in, you know? Sure. And, and so to me, that, that was a big one. And another framework I wanted to introduce to uh, your listeners is yeah, I learned it kind of recently and it kind of is in the same vein, but it's called the even if framework. Okay. I think I've heard of it or something similar, but yeah, elaborate. Okay. Well, I, I hope you have with, with the people you talk to regularly, yeah. but it's kind of this mindset that even if the worst happens, right, let yourself go there and sit in it because sure. we spend all of our life worrying about what if, what if, what if this goes wrong? What if that goes wrong? What if, right. what if, what if, and when you catch yourself fretting and anxious and worrying about all the what ifs, yeah, just reframe it and say, even if. Okay. Yeah. And so in business, like even recently, <laughs> I've had some tough, like I've had some tough uh hits, you know, mm. like in the last few years and in other previous business deals, and I've had people steal from me and mm. things go wrong, and you know, just uh I, I could tell lots mm. of stories about business drama I've been through, and that just comes mm -hmm. from doing a lot of deals and doing a lot of um as an entrepreneur and as a broker, yeah. you see all kinds of crazy stuff. Mm -hmm. and it can really derail you. Mm -hmm. um, but when I've had like forks in the road, like there was one time I was working um, in a corporate job and I was making good money and I had benefits and I had mm -hmm. a wife and one or two little ones at the time. They're still mm -hmm. babies. And I had this opportunity to leave it all and and do this like, brand new startup with an angel investor that was super risky and mm -hmm. i was being required to sign personal guarantees on mm -hmm. debt to do it that i had no i had no money to do it you know so it was like mm -hmm. i'm in my 20s i'm married with kids i've got a basically no assets i've got some student loans and i've got a really secure job that's, <laughs> that's all i got and i'm i give right. up the one security Right to move into this thing. And it was like, it was the even if framework that helped me make that decision. And it was, I basically went to my wife and said, Hey, I've got this opportunity. Mm -hmm. Um, here's, here's the exciting part. Here's what happens <laughs> if it all goes right. Yeah. Um, and that's easy to imagine, but also yeah. here's what could happen if it all goes wrong. Yeah. And I had to just play it out to the very end of like, what would happen? And mm -hmm. we had to kind of look each other in the eye and be like, would you still stay with me if that happened? Mm -hmm. Would would mm -hmm. you still love me? Would mm -hmm. we still have these beautiful kids? Could we stick together? Mm -hmm. Because it would, and, and when it came down to it, we worry like it's going to be this end of the world thing, but it, mm -hmm. it, worst case scenario would have been, um, I was already broke. I would have just been broke with bad credit. <laughs> <laughs> right. And, right. Right. And, and you I could probably good, go get another job, right? Yeah. And the job I left, the last thing my boss said when I gave notice was like, um, well, we're really sorry to lose you, but <laughs> if you ever change your mind, you know, who to call, come back. And they're right. already, and so if you're a valuable employee and you're employable and you know how to do something that makes money, yeah, just know those corporate jobs are always going to be there. Like you can always, yeah. if you know how to sell, if you know how to do something of value, like, mm -hmm you should be able to keep a roof over your head and keep your belly full for your family. Period. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And, and also, I mean, just the, the alternative of there's risk in not taking that chance yeah. as well. You know, um, the, the alternative where you look back and you regret not, not taking that opportunity. So just how did, how did that opportunity turn out? Uh, base hit, base hit. So <laughs> okay. it was, it was like a, a manufacturing startup and, and we went from zero to 50 employees in about 18 months. And it was a rocket ship ride. Um, it was a consumer product in the hunting and outdoor world. And it was kind of like right when I thought we were finally getting profitable and where we could see light at the end of the tunnel after going, you know, digging deep into debt and investment and, all the time and blood, sweat, and tears into launching this brand new concept and product. Um, I got forced out two years hmm. in by the investment group. Hmm. They, they bought out the founders and 
they gave us a bag of money that was not what we were expecting, <laughs> but something. It was mm -hmm. looking back, it was relatively fair, but mm -hmm. I learned the golden rule at the time, which is he who has the gold makes the rules. <laughs> and, <laughs> right. And yeah. So that's kind of my experience as a minority <laughs> shareholder taking on all this risk mm -hmm. and all the stress only to have someone that's not even in the fight with me make mm -hmm. the call to sell Push the you company. Out. So um, I'm sure you've learned a ton from all that. So, uh, you know, but financially were you, how would that compare to had you stayed at your job? I was ahead. Yeah. I was definitely yeah. ahead of the game. Gotcha. Um, I had a little bit of money. I didn't have to go into another job immediately. Mm -hmm. And Got that it. led me into helping other startups get started and then learning about uh, transactions and ultimately led me into business brokerage and into the world that I'm in now. Yeah. Founded so a you, you so. might still be at your old job or s something similar if you yeah, hadn't so taken that. A lot that. of good came out of it. Yep. And, and I, I just want to encourage people to, you know, just remember that God and people are what ultimately matters. Mm -hmm. And when you face that fork in the road, like to, to let yourself sit and that even if everything goes wrong, am I going to die? No. Am I still going to eat? Yes. Yeah. Uh, do I have relationships that can withstand it? Yes. And yeah. Just let yourself do that. Cause what you said earlier, you just breezed over it, but you made one of the best points of this conversation of just the, the risk of regret. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think needs to outweigh your risk of the risk. Sure. You know? and, and yeah. And a lot of times, well, I, I had this, uh, this, uh, roommate in college and he would say he was a power lifter and he, people would say like, you know, that's squatting 800 pounds is bad for your knees, you know? And, and he'd say, do you want to rust out or do you want to wear out? And it was like, you don't want to look back and say you rusted out cause you never tried, you know? Um, I'd rather wear out personally. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that's, that's awesome. So yeah, I feel like I've got to have you back on and <laughs> talk about some more of the, the business stuff, um, and lessons learned there. But, um, so let's see, I'm just going to fire off a few uh, rapid fire questions and then we'll, we'll wrap it up. Yeah. Um, if you could go back and give yourself your 18 year old self, some advice, obviously that was pre pre crash. Um, what would that be? I think, um, I think it would be, it would be to not be afraid to forge my own path mm -hmm. because I, I feel like I went through a little bit of the rich dad, poor dad transformation of, I had like a mom that was struggling to raise three boys as a single parent. And she had the really good kind of traditional advice of get a good education, get a good job. Sure. But ultimately, like there's an entrepreneur inside of me that's creative and a dreamer and ambitious. And I was never going to be happy doing the traditional path. Mm -hmm. And and so my life really opened up to me the second I stepped off the traditional path mm -hmm. and started to self-educate and become an entrepreneur and just get into this crazy entrepreneur adventure world. Yeah. And so I would tell my 18 year old self to just go to college if you want, but start reading these business books. And, and it was really mm -hmm. like reading business books and mm -hmm. being willing to kind of create your own path and make up sure. your own games and make up your own rules and stuff that that's really yeah. been a life changer for me. I love it. Um, you mentioned rich dad, poor dad. Are there any other business books you'd recommend? Oh man, tons of them. <laughs> I, I'm a voracious uh, reader of business books. I, I've, I've read several hundred and I would say wow. like, the one thing by Gary Keller and yeah, Jay it's actually, uh, I've got it right here. I was just looking at it. <laughs> okay, yeah. I love that one. Uh, the richest man in Babylon by George Clayson. Yeah. I love that one. Um, in my space in like the business acquisition space, there's one called buy then build by Walker Dibel. Okay. Um, that's all about buying businesses. Uh, but yeah, there's so many, yeah, so many great ones. That's good. Uh, if you could have coffee with any historical figure, who would it be? <laughs> any historical figure? They could still be alive today. Um, Man. Anybody um, come, come to mind? 
I don't know. I feel like you're supposed to say Jesus, but I don't want to get the same answer. <laughs> doesn't, doesn't have to be, you know. Yeah, that would probably be my number one, but a, a, a um, an alternative pick might be William Wilberforce. Okay. Um, He's a, uh, he kind of led a cultural revolution in, in England that helped them be the uh, get rid of slavery. For, okay. For England. And he did it in a very non-traditional way, basically through kindness and politeness and, and changing the hearts of the English people. And they beat us by, I wanted to say like 50 years or 70 years or something to mm -hmm. uh, abolishing slavery in in the uk and he's just a really interesting character um, interesting yeah have to check. A neat person to talk to huh that's cool um if you were given just handed 10 million dollars tomorrow what would you do with it i, I have probably a super boring answer <laughs> I would, uh i i kind of already know what it what, what i would do um and it's exactly what i'm already trying to do um in my life but it's, it's going to be kind of like secure the, um, I'll call it base of operations for family Fiori here. And that would be like um, everything we need all paid off and enough boring investments to meet the overhead of it. And so it'd be like house. I've got a small plane. I'm still flying today. So I've got a, okay. a beach. Bonanza, cool. And um, and so it'd be basically secure the homestead, the airplane and the education for the kids and have enough, um, boring investments to meet my lifestyle nut Yeah, and have that kind of in a bomb proof, um, trust situation or, or as mm -hmm. secure as I can. And mm -hmm. then with 10 million, it mm -hmm. wouldn't take nearly that much to achieve all of that. Mm -hmm. And then with sure. the remaining amount. I would do what's called home run swings where I would do world changing entrepreneurial ideas, which I have a, a bunch of them <laughs> where if I swing and miss, it still doesn't affect like my general lifestyle or my family's well being. Sure. Uh, but it, it would be using my time and talent and skills to go after something that if this works, it's going to ch change the Pretty world huge. in a substantial way. Yeah. I love it. And, and then if it, and if they do hit, um, it, it could be, you know, stuff that's got upside in the billions kind of stuff and then just snowball that. And I believe in entrepreneurship and business as a force of good in the world. And so mm -hmm. I would do for profit business with, uh, with social causes attached to it that could, that could make yeah. a positive difference on the world. And then I would, instead of going around trying to raise money from rich people, Mm -hmm. I would try to build profitable engines that are simultaneously making money and funding the next home run swing, you know? And so that's, yeah, that's exactly awesome. What I would that's, do. that's really good. Well, if you're, if you're looking for a, a boring investment, I've got a mortgage note fund that's uh, yeah. it, it's it pays monthly. It's a 12 month lockup and um, it's predictable, boring and, you know, there's zero upside, but it's it's not the worst uh, play right now, especially with everything going on. But um, that was also a plug for the listeners out there. Um, Send me the info on it, man. Like I, I am. Yeah. Um, I it's, like uh, making exciting money and then turning it into boring money. Yeah. Uh, this, you know? And uh, then I want to take an, once I have enough boring money, then I want to go play exciting money, <laughs> but at scale. Yeah. You know, so that's. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. Um, awesome. Well, I think we've covered a, covered a ton here and that your, your story is obviously unique. Um, and, uh, it's crazy. I mean, it's just, yeah, there's nothing I can say that's going to add a, too much value to it. Um, you know, it's, it's a wild, wild story. I can't imagine what was going through your mind. I mean, but thank you for walking us through, through all of that. And, and um, walking through kind of your takeaways about, you know, people and God and relationships being the most important and, and how your perspective is, is so much different now than it, than it was and would have been uh, had you not had that experience. Um, where can our listeners reach out to you uh, if they'd like to find you online? Sure. So my company is Bison Business, bisonbusiness.com. 
my Twitter handle is at Clint Fiore. It's just my name, C-L-I-N-T-F-I-O-R-E. And then I also, if you check out my Twitter page, I've got a newsletter called, it's called Probably a Good Deal. And we curate kind of off-market business deals to our subscribers on that. And um, and so if you're ever interested in getting into business business deals and investing in small businesses, you can join my newsletter or check out our website for stuff that's on the market for sale. But um, either even if that's not your world and you're not into that, I just still love to connect with you as a human being and follow along the journey on Twitter. I'm always talking about educational business stuff and then i'll post pictures and videos from flying adventures and travel and stuff like that but i just love to travel love to fly and love to share the journey with my friends super cool i just subscribed so i recommend the listeners do it too yeah you're you're a fun follow on twitter for sure so i've really enjoyed this uh conversation and i'm looking forward to keeping in touch and uh and i know that you've added a, a ton of value to our listeners so i really appreciate it thanks a lot clint Okay. Thank you. And to our listeners out there, thanks for spending your most valuable resource with us. And that is your time. Thanks everyone. Take care.